Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another amazing episode on the Unleashing Potentials podcast. I'm your host, Bernadette, and joining me today is Leslie Wells, all the way from the UK, you guys. How are you, Leslie? Thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really well, thank you. That's awesome. We were talking about the time difference there. It's not as bad um, as I thought because there are different parts of the world where it's it's crazy, the time zones. If it's morning here, it's 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. It's wild. What time is it where you are? It's 5 p.m. at the moment. Oh, okay. And it's 10 a.m. here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I try to avoid working with clients in Australia and New Zealand because one of us is going to have to be out of bed at the wrong time. So <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been trying to coordinate uh, an interview with a gentleman from Australia. And we're both still, I'm still struggling to find the proper time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, what do you do, Leslie, and how long have you been doing it? I've been a, a hypnotherapist now for five years. Um, for the last two and a half years, I've been practicing Reiki energy healing. Mm -hmm. And then more recently, in the last 18 months, um, I started delivering, well, it's, it would come under the banner of coaching, but it's more um, emotional well-being and helping people to um, create new agreements with themselves because we all have subconscious agreements with ourselves that affect all of our behaviors and beliefs and how we think about ourselves. And sometimes I, that can hold us back, that can affect our mental well-being and that can have knock-on effect with physical well-being. So it's finding out what those agreements are and then creating new ones. Yeah. And starting a whole new belief set that can then take you forward. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. It sounds so exciting what you do. Um, did you always uh, wanted to do the work that you're doing right now? Funny, if you'd spoken to me 10 years ago and said that um, you're going to be a hypnotherapist by 2019, I think I would just look at you and said, <laughs> really... <laughs> Um, but having said that, um, and it, it's not a brag, it's just one of these things that I tend to find people talk to me, even strangers at bus stops. Um, I just seem to have that approachable face, I suppose. Maybe I put up the energy that says, hey, you can talk to me. Um, and so I've had people come to me and sort of offload sometimes and just need someone to listen to. And I've never really thought of it in terms of a therapy, but when I started moving in that direction, I started moving in that direction because of my own mental well-being, the struggles I'd had for years, and then realized, actually, I can use this to help other people. And now I can see the sense in why people tend to come and talk to me. So it all ties in. Yeah, that's awesome. It happens to me too all the time. I don't know people, they just approach me, they they talk to me. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating how it happens to some people and it doesn't happen to other people. Like you mentioned, would you say it's uh, energy related? I don't think it is. I think very much. And since I became a lot more aware of that, and I don't want to call it kept consciously aware, but I have become more aware of energy and how it works and how you can feel different things but I've also started to find more people coming to me who think and feel the same way and so anyone now who used to be in my life but still cannot get their heads around energy and how it works and how you can use it to help yourself but they're still resistant to it they seem to have just drifted away from me and those who do understand it, I don't have to explain it to them. I don't have to sit and explain myself. I've brought more of those people into my life and it hasn't been a deliberate thing. It's just happened. Mm -hmm. So that, that I think is one of the effects of energy is that we attract those that we don't need to explain ourselves to. Yeah, 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 I agree. Um, there's so many different terms or types of energies how would you describe the energy you're talking about? Let's say someone doesn't know what what the energy is you mentioned. 
That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sort of kind of a kinetic energy, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, it's invisible, but you you feel it. And I think everyone does experience this without actually realizing what it is or even questioning it or thinking about it. But we know all of us have done this. You've walked into a room full of people and you know instantly whether you feel comfortable in there or you don't. And that comes from the energy that's already in there. And is it matching your energy? Do you feel then that you can walk further forward and join the the company of people and talk to them? Or do you suddenly think, no way, Jose, I'm out of here. (laughs) And that is, that's a basic term of, of how energy works is that it can repel and it can attract. Um, But from your own personal level, it's where your energy is. And wherever your energy is, you will feel comfortable when you find energy at that same level. Mm -hmm. But if it's not at the right level for you, chances are you'll just walk away from it. But we we all know how it feels when we meet someone for the first time and we either think, Mm -hmm. don't like you, or yeah, I can tell you everything and I don't even know you. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard of energy vampires, which also ties into spirituality somehow. In your own words and opinion, how would you define an energy vampire? Because they're everywhere. Oh, to my mind, they, these are people who um, enjoy living in misery. <laughs> so misery becomes their basic energy and they love it. And they don't, it, either they don't want to be any different or they don't know how to be. But living in that misery, they also live with a lot of fear, a fear of rejection, a fear of um, you know people not loving them, a fear of not being accepted. Um, but because they don't know how to take themselves out of that, they look for people to join in their pity party because misery loves company. So it's almost as if they're carrying around with them a, a bottle of poison that they drink from every day. <laughs> But then they offer it to other people and see who will drink it as well. And then when they've got somebody who does, they start pulling them in and they feed off their energy. And then if they can make that person feel bad about themselves or feel low and feel miserable, then briefly they feel better because at least that person either feels as bad, if not worse, than they do. Mm, Yeah, yeah. And, And unfortunately, I get this so much myself because I'm I'm a very very sensitive empath and and I I take on people's even illnesses I think from a headache and fatigue and um yeah I do things to protect and and heal my my energy um how would you um explain to people some of the many ways that they can protect their energy first thing I would say is um Never take anything personally, <laughs> yep. which might sound easier than, said than done mm-hmm. because we're programmed to take things personally. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's understanding that whatever anybody else is expressing, whatever if it's anger or even if it's happiness, whatever it is that they're expressing, it's all about them. Mm-hmm. It's not about you. So even if somebody were to come up and punch you on the nose, much as that would hurt you, it's not actually about you. It's not personal. It's all about them. It's that particular day, that moment, that anger, whatever it is that they just need to let it go. Mm -hmm. So when you understand then that the only thing that's personal to you is yourself and nothing anybody else does or thinks or says is about you, then you will stop absorbing their energy because that energy exchange is almost an agreement of I believe exactly what you're telling me about me Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so that can prevent you from absorbing that energy Um, but there are other sort of useful techniques I find um, one that's really useful is I'll just close my eyes and I don't have to go into a very deep sense of trance I can just close my eyes and visualize a nice big bubble going around me now you can choose whatever color you want for that bubble sometimes mine is purple other times it's white 
sometimes it's blue, it's whatever, wherever my energy is, I suppose. And I put that bubble around me. That is a bubble of protection mm -hmm. and nothing can get past it. And then I make sure that I'm I'm in there and I'm feeling it and it's real. And then I take that with me wherever I go. Mm -hmm. And then I'm less likely to be affected by other people's energy. Mm -hmm. And if I see anyone coming towards me that I think is going to try and get through that very quickly and mentally, I just imagine it being reinforced yeah. to stop them from being mm -hmm. able to affect me. Thank you for sharing. Uh, since we're in the topic of energy, let's talk about Reiki energy healing. First of all, for those who don't know, what is Reiki? And then there's energy added to it and then healing added to it. Uh, yes. what, what, what are your methods and what is it? Reiki is roughly about 3,000 years old and it originated in Japan. Um, it's quite often paired up with things like Hinduism and Buddhism because it it those religions kind of taken a lot of the beliefs of Reiki in them. My Reiki master, when he takes on new students, will say there are three hundred and fifty rules to Reiki. Number one, harm none. Number two, harm none. Number three, harm none. Can you guess the other 347? So Reiki is all about helping and healing and there's no harm. Mm -hmm. And a Reiki healer, you're you're challenging challenging excuse me, channeling mm -hmm. energy. Um you're taking it from what some refer to as divine source. So you have a higher self, that is your divine source. That is your connection to the higher spirit. And you're channeling, channeling that through all of your meridians, down through all of your chakras in your body, and then through the chakras in the palms of the hands, which is when you place those over somebody else, mm -hmm. so that your energy then stimulates their energy to flow. Mm. Um, so... I suppose if you wanted to have some kind of familiar reference, the closest I can give you, and I don't mean to step on anyone's toes in any religious sense, but the closest I can give you is Jesus. Mm. So that using of the hands to heal yeah. and using the energy to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a kind of magic, I suppose. It, it is still viewed in some areas as witchcraft. Even my local county council still has it on the books as witchcraft in the 21st century. But <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, but it's all, yes, it's all to do with your divine enlightenment. And during your training, you learn various symbols as well. So you have empowerment and self-healing symbols and distance healing symbols that you use in order to strengthen the energy that you're using. And when you're healing somebody, or you're not healing them, you're stimulating them to heal. It's your intent. So a Reiki healer will scan a, a client and find out where along their meridians and their chakras, where there is energy, where it feels stuck, where it feels hottest and coldest. And you don't have to tell a Reiki practitioner anything. You're not there to give them your life story. This isn't a counseling session. All they will say to you is, um, I'm feeling whatever it is in this particular chakra. So it might be the ch heart chakra that's to do with your love of yourself, love of others, um, love in general, and it's, it's happiness as well. So, you know, there's a blockage here. So are you experiencing, it could be to do with experiencing um, some kind of un unhappiness or trauma in your life. Um, is this making sense to you? Is there something that you can think of that matches that? And all I have to say is yes or no. Mm -hmm. They don't have to lie there and say, oh, well, so-and-so passed away the other day and all this, that, and the other. They don't have to say a word. Mm -hmm. So long as we know that they're aware and that that's how it's affecting them. And then our intention is to help flow with that energy 
for them to heal. So you're helping to unblock the energy and get it to move so that you're giving them back the balance in their body, the balance of their energy, which promotes an improvement in their well-being. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I'm told that I have energy healing abilities. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to use them. I'm, I don't know. I'm looking in potentially trying to find some type of school or someone to teach me <laughs> what's <laughs> happening with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of, um, let's talk about Kundalini. Um, what happens when energies get stuck and our bodies are energy field Kundalini is your your root chakra so it's right down down in the base of the spine pretty much mm -hmm. um that's the seat of your your own power your personal power it's also um your sexual energy but it's that sexual energy is more than just sex in itself um and it's where you also get an um, aggression and power it's colored red because, because of that power and that passion but it's when it's blocked that's when you tend to get a lot of self-doubt you'll feel anger and a lack of control a lack of power you will feel you know powerlessness as if uh, I don't know I'm just a spectator in my life I don't know what the hell is going on Mm -hmm. um, now, in the Western practice of Reiki, because of, I suppose, decency, we do not lay hands upon the root chakra, the Kundalini, because of its position. It's quite an intimate area of the body, so we don't. But we can work around it mm -hmm. to get the energy to move. Um, and also, you will tend to find that the kundalini, the root chakra, is way, way out of the body. So you might think of it being the base of the spine, but it might be pushed way, way out, way beyond the body. So you scan around to feel where it is and then bring it back into place and lock it into place mm -hmm. so that they will then, the client will feel they've got a bit more of that power energy back. They feel yeah. a bit more balanced, a bit more in control. Yeah. Um, because that is the, the root of how you feel about yourself. It's the root of, of your your own power, your own empowerment. Mm -hmm. And everyone likes to feel like they've got some control over what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I've heard so many different books on the chakras because two, three years ago, I had no clue what that was. And yeah. um I, I can say, I think from the heart up to here, those are doing fine. As you can see, I'm talking. <laughs> it's just <laughs> the, the the other chakras I'm struggling with. And I know I'm not alone as well, which um, we're going to talk about the role of trauma, uh, you know, with healing. Tell us your own experience and also how you've helped many clients and or, and, or just in general, how someone can begin their healing journey. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it, I had um, experience when I was seven years old. Um, um, basically, it was, a, it was a sexual assault that happened when I was at school. So I was in a place where I was supposed to be safe. Um, but as I've learned in the years since, um, I also have birth trauma. And the birth trauma affected how I dealt with the experience when I was seven years old. So my birth trauma rendered me hyper-independent. So everything comes down to me and only I can deal with it and I can't trust anybody else to do it. That was the mindset. Without realising that, because at the age of seven, you're not aware of that. You're not switched into it. There's no way. You, you, did, you just don't know. Um, but I knew that what was happening had to stop. But I didn't feel I could trust the adults around me to make it stop. So I did it myself. I took myself out of the situation that put me in this person's path and it stopped. And then I just carried on with my life. But then, of course, these experiences have such a, an effect on us that years down the line, they start affecting relationships, friendships, how you view yourself, how you view the world, your confidence and so on. 
and I had quite an emotional upset, I suppose, it, would you call it a breakdown, uh, when I was about 17. And then I had another one when I was 27. And at that point, that's when I started that merry-go-round of going to the doctor, being given the prescription for medication, going to counselling, going to therapy. And this happening on repeat. And I thought eventually by about the third time, I thought, if this keeps repeating, why am I not getting any better? And then it dawned on me that the level of depression I was living with was my normal. So we, we hear about high functioning stress, we hear about high functioning anxiety, where that is your normal. I and mean, you don't realize that that's where you're at. And that was me, anxiety and depression. That was my normal. And when I had these collapses, these breakdowns, that's when I hit, hit a whole new low. But I never got higher than that point. So the, the drugs and the, the counselling just brought me back here. And I never got any better. And nobody decided to try and explore the root of what was going on. Because here's some more pills, here's some more counselling. And in 2017, when I was about 18 months into my longest ever emotional collapse, um, I went to a workshop, a meditation workshop for the whole day. I remember just kind of dragging myself in. I remember floating out. I'd gone past that point. Mm. And I stayed on that high for about three or four days. And so eventually I got in touch with my doctor and I said, I think I found my cure. I need you to get me off the meds. And so we worked on that. And three months later, I came off the medication and... About a month after that, my dad passed away rather quickly and unexpectedly. And I thought, I'm going to go back there again, aren't I? Mm. And I never did. In the, in the intervening time, I'd kept up the meditation practice. I'd taken on yoga. So I was doing a lot of breath work. I was doing a lot of uh, mindfulness work in that respect. And retraining my mind and emotions. And it was then that I decided that I wanted to take this further out. I wanted to help other people who have been struggling like I had to tell them that this isn't who you are. This There is an end to this, regardless of what they might tell you. Actually, there is an end to this. Mm -hmm. And I started training in hypnotherapy. And the hypnotherapy opened my mind up to how my mind works. It taught me so much. And so I worked on my own healing whilst I was doing my studying for hypnotherapy. And then with the, the Reiki healing, which peeled back a load more layers. So during the training, you, you're peeling back layers of your own trauma. You, you can sit up on the bench and completely bawl your eyes out, but that's fine because you're just letting it go. And that's perfectly all right. So all of these things have helped me with my healing. So then I can bring all of that experience in to help others. Mm -hmm. And I can see where they perhaps need to start that healing journey, which part of them is feeling it the most, and then mm -hmm. bring my experience in to help them with that. So healing is a very personal thing. There is no one size fits all. It's all about listening actively to what is going on for somebody else mm -hmm. and then going through your own little cupboard of expertise and techniques and then coming up with the tailored approach to that particular person to help them i i don't heal anybody but me mm -hmm. but i help to facilitate healing in somebody else so i give them a toolkit and then they do the healing i support them for it Mm -hmm. yeah 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 thank you for sharing feel that you're telling so many people's stories and what you just shared the depression and what happened to you as a child um and just trauma and the healing journey and um 
medications. <laughs> I, I'm on quite a few of them. And I find that uh, most most doctors, that's where they go straight to. They they don't do other forms of therapy. I mean, it's getting better. More could be done because not every emotion or trauma we experience can be medicated and uh, having the illusion that it's going to take it away because we live with it for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing about healing. My logo on the podcast is healing together and um, I'm all about healing and uh, yeah, healing is, it's painful. It's hard. It's rewarding and it's needed. Yeah. Um, I think as well, sometimes it, it seems like an ongoing process. There is no set time limit. You know, you can't say, oh, well, in three months' time, you'll be hopefully done, you'll be cured, you'll be fine. Yeah. It is, it is an ongoing process. You are a work in progress all the time because as you, you heal, you heal a layer, you heal one thing, but then you suddenly find yourself triggered by something. And that is when you're being told, actually, you've got a bit more healing to do. So it's not then a case of sitting there saying, oh, I thought I'd got all the way through it. There must be something wrong with me. It's not a blame game. It's a time game. Mm -hmm. And it's allowing yourself time and allowing yourself to feel what's going on and understanding it and not giving yourself a hard time. You can't speed the process up. You can only go at your pace. So it doesn't matter. It's not a race. You're not going to sit beside of other people who seem further ahead than you. It doesn't matter. It's where you are that matters. Yeah, yeah. And and from experience, you know, it's to, I think, set boundaries because not everyone is going to be at the same level of healing as you are. Um, and I find that, especially with the culture we live in, if someone cries, you know, they make them feel bad, that they're weak, they're expressing emotion. They should have gotten rid of the burden or trauma they're carrying. Oh, two, three months ago, years ago, right? Um, it's just, there'll always be that criticism and judgment. And it's to learn to kind of shut that off and to focus on the inside of what's happening for us. So that to anyone who has experience somebody else saying to them oh you should be over it by now oh you should be through this by now oh you shouldn't be crying about this if it's somebody else worse off than you they're not on a healing journey they are still living in their own trauma without realizing it they're not on a healing journey they have no idea what you're going through what you're experiencing what you're trying to achieve so whatever they say let it go Again, it's about them. It's not about you. And it's not what you should or need to do from their aspect. It's what you feel you want to do and what you want to achieve. And that's what you keep sight of. So, yes, having those boundaries that say, this is about me, not about you. And I know where I am and I know what I have to do. Yeah. And that's, yeah, it is. It's not allowing someone else to influence you because they have no idea what you're going through mm -hmm. yeah which ties into beliefs and behavior because what we think what we believe somehow transform how we act and uh, react and help people what are your thoughts i think a lot of beliefs as well they they come down they're inherited through the generations um and you know previous generations have never really questioned things that I said, you know, it's like some things are family trait or this is a saying in our family. Mm -hmm. And in my dad's family, for instance, the, um, he would quite often say, um, somebody in our family must have been really awful because we never get the breaks, we never have the money. Mm -hmm. And then he would say, um, rich people can't be nice people. You don't get all that by being nice to people. And so he had this idea that... Um, money doesn't come to most people and he struggled as a result all his life and then having worked on my family tree for a good number of years i discovered that about five six generations back a relative of a direct ancestor was hanged for murder um, as a result of a robbery 
that went wrong. Um, and so that belief that somebody in the family had done something wrong was very true. Um, money doesn't come to us because we don't deserve it. And nice people don't have money. And, you know, um, rich people aren't nice people. So all of that came together. Uh, and I worked all of that out in the last few years. And I wish my father was still alive because like I said to him, by the way, I know the answer now. <laughs> and suddenly he isn't. But at the same time, I then had to very consciously do a visualization to say, you know, this is your belief, but it's not mine. And I'm not carrying your excess baggage anymore. So have this back. Pass it back down the line because this isn't mine. Yeah. And to release yourself. So it's understanding that so many beliefs that we carry with us, we take on. And we take them on at a very young age when we don't have a conscious filter. We cannot really make sense of what's being said. We just take it on. But, you know, they're saying that, so it must be true. Mm -hmm. So you're told, you, you can't sing. I can't sing. It must be true. Um, you're rubbish at art. So that stops you from exploring your artistic talents because you believe it, they're the adults they must know. So it starts with your parents, then it goes into teachers, even siblings, and even people in your own classroom. And all of these things coming at you and you take them on because you think, well, if they think that, then it must be true. Clearly I'm doing something. It must be true. Mm -hmm. Without realizing that everything that's come to you has either been an inherited belief or it's somebody else's idea of themselves that they're then projecting onto you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes it takes a while to figure out what's happening. Because some of us, it depends on the childhood we've had. We're so nice. We don't want to hurt people because we're so empathic. We feel so much. And sometimes it takes a very, very long time to recognize and realize that people are taking advantage of us. They're feeding off our energy and um, who we are. We're just existing, but not living. That used to be me, right? And uh, that's why I'm doing everything. I don't care who likes it, who doesn't like it. I'm singing. I have. I do art. And I'm, I'm dabbing into whatever it is because all my life, even as a kid, I was told I'm dumb. I'm ugly. I can't do this. I'll never be anything. And... I'm like, I'm doing it, not to prove anything, but I'm doing it for me. Yeah. They're no the people pleaser. I know when I, I first decided to color my hair blue, and my brother looked at me and said, what have you done that for? Hmm. And I said, because I wanted to. I've always wanted to. And now I'm doing it, and I really haven't done it for anybody else. I've done it for me. If I get compliments, all well and good, but I've done this for me. And if you don't like it, celebi. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. So I, I stopped being affected by it. Whereas maybe 10, 12 years ago, I'd have thought, oh God, I've made a mistake. I shouldn't have done it. <laughs> but this time I thought, no, I've done the right thing. And I know I've done the right thing because it feels right for me. And when it feels comfortable, when that gut feeling feels settled, when the heart feels settled, mm -hmm. if, yeah, that's the right thing. Most definitely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, stop being a people pleaser because the only person you're not pleasing is you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And when we speak up, when we set those boundaries, I think even family members will walk away. My but door is always open. open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know. I just visualize my mind and my life. Yeah, I'm, I'm sleeping. I'm doing my own thing, but go in and out. Go in and out if you want, but once I'm tired, I lock it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about, um, I think we talked about mental health a little bit. Um, just in general, what would you like to see for, you know, for governments um, or officials where you are or around the world to do when it comes to uh, mental health? First of all, I would like it to stop being a political football. Um, it gets talked about an awful lot around election time and then it kind of gets swept under the carpet. And it's still being treated separately. So you've got physical health, 
and then mental health. And they use the term mental health and it has that automatic um, connection to instability. And they talk about mental health. So it needs to be more to do with well-being and overall well-being. And the fact that the mind and body can't operate separately. They are one. And whatever affects one affects the other. So you have to treat the whole body, not just a symptom, not just an area. You've got to take everything into account. And in this country particularly, it's the investment side of things. They just don't like investing in people's health. They want you to move towards more, I think, of the models of other countries where it's private insurance that pays for it. They really don't want the hassle of helping you with your health and well-being, even physical well-being now um, in this country. Trying to get to see a doctor, you can be waiting for two or three months. It used oh. to be bad at one time when it was two weeks, but now it, it's really ramped up it's it's quite astonishing mm -hmm. and so people are starting to turn more to self-help and they're also stepping out there and looking at the alternative therapies and saying okay for enough I'll bite the bullet I'll pay for this because I need it because the doctors just aren't supporting them with it and if they do have recommended therapists it's a very closed community so in this country if you've trained with a certain trainer and you've got the, the right accreditation then doctors in the health service will recommend you if you've taken any other kind of route and have any other kind of accreditation they won't even look at you mm. but you're just as good as anybody else you're just not on their books but also it's understanding the best recommendation for their patients and rather than just going, have you thought of doing hypnotherapy? Have you thought of giving it a try? Mm -hmm. And then referring them to a hypnotherapist, they might not gel with that person. They might not be able to establish rapport and trust. And if you don't, then hypnotherapy won't work. But also if it's a free referral, they have nothing to lose. So they're not necessarily going to be that committed to making it work anyway. Mm -hmm. And then they'll walk away and say, that didn't work. So it needs to be a whole new narrative around how they approach health and well-being from a whole aspect, not just from head and body and symptoms and body parts and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Putting the investment into it, but also widening out the availability of different kinds of therapies and practices because you can't have one size fits all it's proven it doesn't work so you have to have something that's got a wider choice and you can tailor it to each person yeah and i'd like to see more of that and it's still too too splintered and the health service is still too regimented mm -hmm. it needs to relax down more yeah yeah thank you for sharing and i think at times they wait until it's too late because people anybody with mental health issues which I, which I think all of us if we have a brain the psyche that that that's kind of where that word came from the stigma just robs me the wrong way <laughs> right if if anyone's living they have a mind a brain the psyche all of us have some type of mental health issues <laughs> or just mental uh, condition, uh, whether it's diagnosed, not diagnosed, all of us get anxious, nervous about a meeting, getting on stage. And if we don't get what we want, we, we get angry. We take it back resentment. I could go on and on about it, but this stigma is so heavy. Um, that's why I have to talk about it, especially with the stuff I'm diagnosed with. And, uh, I'm, and I'm happy also talking about it because we're creating room for the next generation and space for those who actually need it because not everyone who is suffering are actually advocating for themselves because they're like, what's the point? They just don't do it. Yeah. You take into account the different kinds of conditioning that people have. So depending on where you are in the world, there's your society. There's also um, different religious conditionings. 
and and then there's always those um constraints that are forced upon us so you know if you're female you're expected to do this and if you're male you're expected to do that and uh, there's all kinds of different layers of conditioning that we have that inflict a kind of trauma on us and i i tend to de define trauma as anything that leaves an imprint and none of us goes through life without something leaving an imprint none of us gets through it without any baggage at all because if if you can sit there and say i have absolutely no baggage at all you've possibly not yet quite examined exa what's driving you or you've been living in a cave as a hermit all of your life without any interaction with people so there is always something that leaves an imprint sometimes that imprint is deeper and they're the ones that have the most lasting effect and rather than living in denial it takes courage to admit that i've got something that needs fixing it's not always easy to step out of it because it's almost like you're stepping out of a comfort zone but you're actually in a very toxic uncomfortable environment that you've just gotten used to and stepping out of it that you know am i going to be the same person are the people around me still going to be there well if they are there then that's because they love you regardless and if they can't handle you healing they will drift away but that's okay because you're pulling people that love you yeah, healing yeah yeah, yeah you know? and again that comes back to the energy that then you start to to put out there mm -hmm. definitely so like i say that's why all of this is individual it can't be one size fits all and everybody has their own journey their own experiences and their own levels of traumatic imprint mm -hmm. that they need to deal with yeah yeah thank you for sharing and um that's why I'm on a mission because some people are in so much denial that they deny something's wrong, deny that they they need therapy, whatever it may be. It's to break that, to kind of shake people a little bit, to say, hey, it's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've experienced it. I'm there right now. And it's okay to experience it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've yeah. learned it before now to friends and I've said to them, you know, it's... It's like when you're born, someone sticks you on a spike, right? So you're sitting on a spike all your life, but because you've been sitting on a spike all of your life, you've got you've been used to the discomfort, so you don't notice it's there. Mm -hmm. Until someone comes along and shakes the spike. And then you realize how uncomfortable it is. But then you don't look to yourself for how to get off the spike. You shout at the person that shook it. Yeah. And that's the denial process, is when you're still putting out there that, you know, if you hadn't done this, this wouldn't have happened. It's a case of what's my part in all of this and how can I mm -hmm. change this? Mm -hmm. It's you that has to get up a spike. No one's going to lift you off it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which reminds me of the five stages of grief. I think denial is one of them, uh, which I think ties into everything we just talked about, uh, which can apply in so many different ways and aspects. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, you start yeah. a healing journey and you change in a way you go through a, like a grieving process because you're grieving the person you used to be as you become the person you're supposed to be or you're meant to be so you're, you're leaving behind the one that they've told you to be you're becoming the one that you were born to be but there is still that that grieving process that you're saying goodbye to something that you've been so familiar with and that's what makes it difficult sometimes to move forward mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah um so what would you like for people to get from this amazing episode overall I would like for them to, um, first of all, understand that it's okay to feel. It's okay to feel emotions. Emotions are energy. And if you think of energy like the electricity that goes down a wire into a plug, without that electricity, then when you plug that plug in and switch the switch, nothing's going to happen. So the emotion is there. It's the energy. But it's understanding why you have these emotions and becoming the master of them rather than them controlling you. And 
it's not a weakness to have emotions. It's not a weakness to cry. It takes strength to ask for help. So that can't be a weakness. You are a sentient being. You are an emotional being. So be comfortable with that. And even if it feels uncomfortable at first, you will get past it and become comfortable with understanding your emotions, accepting them, and instead of resisting them, letting them go, letting them flow, letting them move on, you can release them. You don't have to hold them on. Because if you hold on to emotion, if you button it up tight and bury it deep and you don't express it, you don't want to burden other people with your problems, you don't want to be seen as weak. You're going to store that energy in different places in your body. It's going to go into every cell in your body. It's going to go into every single organ, including your skin. And then some point down the line, you might get a physical symptom. And you might just go to the doctor for a medication. But that physical symptom is your body waving a white flag saying, we have an issue we need to solve. So listen to what your body is telling you. Because it's possibly your energy that's got stuck. And it's time to let it go. And when you start that healing process emotionally, quite often you'll find any physical symptoms begin to disappear. And eventually whatever medication you've been given, you realize, actually, you don't need that now. That has served its purpose. And it has served a purpose. It's helped you along. But you know, it's like a crutch. Eventually, once you've healed that leg and it's broken, you don't need the crutch anymore. Yeah. And you yeah. can stand free mm -hmm. yeah i agree yeah um i have two questions for you as we wrap up uh the first one is what is the meaning of life for you live to love it be happy and achieve whatever you want to achieve mm -hmm. you are here to live life for you yeah yeah Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Uh, my last question is, where can people find you and work with you? Okay, you can find me on LinkedIn. And um, I'm listed on LinkedIn as Eagle-LCHT, which is Life Coaching and Holistic Therapies. And you can find me with the same um, suffix as well on Facebook. So I have a, a business page there too. And I have an email, which is all together, all lowercase is eaglelchht at gmail.com. So you can send me a message or you can contact me either through my Facebook profile page and through LinkedIn. And we can just have a discussion about whatever you want to talk about, a starting point. So, you know, you come to talk to me. I'm not necessarily going to sit there and say, this is what I can offer you. This is what I'm going to do for you. I think I'm just happy to have a chat over coffee, even if it's a virtual one like this, and just have a chat and get to know each other. And then you can talk freely, knowing you're in a, a safe environment, a very confidential environment that you can offload if you want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Thank you. Well, Leslie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for all you do. Keep shining. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just so honored to have you on to share uh, your experience and the work that you're doing. So thank you. It's been a huge pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You're welcome.